Don't forget that today's show is brought to you by Bond Speed Wheels. Find us at www.bondspeedwheelswithans.com or on Facebook at Bond Speed Wheels. Remember, our wheels are made in America, right here in Anaheim, California, and every wheel is custom built to order. Our forged billet wheels are built street tough. Bond Speed Wheels. So welcome to another edition of Street Rod and Custom Radio, where we bring you the parts, the people, and the stories behind our automotive hobby. It's right here where we talk about hot rods, rat rods, street rods, race cars, muscle cars. If it's got wheels, you know we're going to talk about it. If it goes fast, for sure we're going to talk about it. I'm your host, Brad Fanshawe, and this week we're coming to you live from Lincoln, Nebraska, with Speedway Motors, and I'm going to tell you a little bit. Some of you already know that uh, my history before I was partners with Boyd Coddington and was building hot rods out in California, that I was a Midwestern guy, and I came from Omaha, Nebraska. I went to high school and college back here, and all the speed shops that were back here, and all of these you know, cruising and the street racing and the drag racing and the dirt track racing, everything that went on back here, We all would kind of come to this one location in Lincoln, Nebraska. I would roll in with my friends, and uh, we would kind of oogle and ogle at all the cool things. And I got to tell you, there was one motor that used to always catch my attention. And it was in this shop that uh, was right here in Lincoln. It was an all-polished ZL1 big block motor. And uh, you know what? I've come back to the place to find that motor and to find the man who created everything and the reason that motor was sitting there. I'm at Speedway Motors in Lincoln, Nebraska, and my guest this week is Speedy Bill Smith, the founder and the man who has created this empire. And we're not only at where Speedway Motors is headquartered, we're in their museum, and it is spectacular. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you. You Fun know, to be here. I'm, I'm glad that you are here. It's, uh, it's such a, a great thing to get you out and have you come out to the museum today so that we could talk about uh, how Speedway Motors came to be, your career in racing and sponsoring cars. and um, it's uh, Building cars. Building cars. Building cars. I mean, we, but you sponsored and built, didn't you? Uh, f- sponsored a few, but built 90% of them. Great. That's, you know what? Hands on. And, and that's what's great, and that's what gave you kind of the, uh, you know, your, your whole catalog empire. It was because you had that knowledge and you had that base from doing it yourself, right? Well, to understand a book, whether it's the Bible or whatever you have your interest in in life, uh, you better know everything from the front cover to the back cover. And you know it page by page, don't you? World according to Bill. <laughs> so... I mean, let's, let's, let's just jump right into it. I mean, you know, Speedway Motors today produces a, uh, a, a massive catalog of parts for the hardcore builder, the hardcore racer, everything that, uh, that they might need. But it really started uh, with you jumping on a motorcycle and doing some racing back in the 40s, didn't it? Well, you know, I was young, and we all go through hatching and dying there's in the period in between uh everything that's living does that the tree in your front yard or the easter bunny or whoever it is <laughs> uh so i had a lot of interest from the time i was 14 i was exposed by a gentleman that lived a couple blocks from me in collecting junk and he had collected a 1917 Model T pickup truck. And so I was making a quarter an hour if I would trade him and take it out and trade rather than money. Uh, If I took it out in money, it was 15 cents. So uh, I got my first Model T Ford by working for him quarter an hour, and it was $17.50. Uh, you couldn't drive in Nebraska until you were 16, but uh, you could sneak around the back roads. Uh, so I learned to drive the Model T. I learned to keep it running. I learned to, 
that it had uh, water in the radiator, and when it got cold, you better put some alcohol in it <laughs> so that it didn't freeze, and learned all the things that you need to know about driving an automobile. So, so you got the baseline and uh, got all the tricks of the trade, learned all the things, and, uh, and cars weren't as complicated back then, were they? Uh, to some extent, no, but to uh, many, far more complicated. Because a Model T has three pedals on the floor. The operational end of it, yeah. And, and a Model T has a very quick steering. I tried to keep, teach my cousin how to drive my Model T. <laughs> we ended up on its side in the ditch. Like a lot of Model Ts did on their side in the ditch, didn't right. they? And we're going to have more with Speedy Bill Smith right here at Speedway Motors when we come back to Street Rod and Custom Radio. So don't go away. We're back. You're listening to Street Rod and Custom Radio. I'm your host, Brad Fanshawe. And don't forget, you can find me on Facebook at Bond Speed Brad Fanshawe. And you can find one of our sponsors who helped bring this show today, Barrett Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auctions. Visit them at barrett-jackson.com. We're here in Lincoln, Nebraska today, and I am at Speedway Motors, and I'm with the legendary Speedy Bill Smith, the man who has brought this sport to another level through his love and his enthusiasm for not only racing, but for hot rods and for the whole automotive hobby. And uh, before I go any farther, I want to make sure that you know where to find out more about Speedway Motors. You can find them at SpeedwayMotors.com, so go there, check out their website. But when we left, Bill, we were talking about, uh, you know, kind of getting right down to the roots of things, the 40s, and you were just getting into it, you were learning the basics and learning how to maintain your car, but it seems like uh, your enthusiasm for the automobile and for racing was about as fast as uh, your cars were on the track, because uh, you uh, jumped right into it, and uh, one of the things that, uh, that I read was that uh, you, you stated that your enthusiasm, uh, I want to make sure I get this right because I don't want to offend you, but that your enthusiasm for racing maybe wasn't as good as your skill level, or excuse me, your skill level wasn't as good as your enthusiasm, so early on you realized that maybe building the cars and hiring out some drivers was, was a better thought? Well, I, I was doing some things that didn't make my tummy feel good. <laughs> uh, I was an only child and I had a tough love mother that uh, lived to be 99, so uh, we always enjoyed each other tremendously. And uh, I was telling her that I wasn't going racing when I took my motorcycle to the county fairs around on Sunday afternoon that I was there to view. Uh, I was lying to her, and it didn't make me feel good. So I uh, was pr pretty good at uh, motorcycle racing, but then when I tried Roaring Roadsters and we killed two people at one time in Council Bluffs, Iowa, decapitated them, wow. I uh, thought maybe I had better, because I had busted the car up a couple of times when, I, when the Roadsters first started in Hastings, Nebraska in, uh, in the, before the 40s. No, it was in the 40s, late 40s. But uh, it uh, was, I could spend more effort building the car and making the car go faster and stay together. And uh, if it was a 10-lap race, we finished it. If it was a 20-lap race, we finished it. A lot of fallout in the early days because of, different knowledges and so forth. So uh, you just honed your, your interest and uh, uh, you didn't say, well, I'm going to go play golf. I should be uh, changing the bearings in that flathead Ford motor or something like that. So uh, you have to stay pointed, I guess, is what, for lack of a better word, uh, with all your enthusiasms. And... How long you stay pointed at that could be a week, could be a month, but it's been 62 years for myself. 
So you, you basically, you took your enthusiasm and you focused it in the direction of building those cars and, and being successful in that area so that you didn't have to go lie to mom, right? I didn't want to lie to mom, <laughs> and uh, I'm a competitor. Uh, uh, I was a lover, not a fighter, so I couldn't uh, punch the guy if we were arguing. Uh, so I had to do it in a different venue. Well, let me ask you this. Now, when I first moved to Omaha, there were still some remnants across the river over in Council Bluffs. And when you brought this up, it kind of brought it up in the back of my head of, of an old racetrack right there on the river. Was that called Playland Raceway? Playland Park. Yeah. And that, the remnants of that were still there, long gone now. But so that would have been one of the places where you raced. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, one of my good old drivers, Tiny Lund, got married at Playland Park in front of the grandstand really? where the people came to watch the race, not a marriage. <laughs> now, they don't do things like that too much anymore, uh, but uh, a lot of crazy things that, and explaining times to people are very tough. We didn't yeah. have interstates. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have television. We, all, you know, all of these things that bring awareness to you or the public, uh, it makes uh, it hard to explain. Well, you know, let, let's try a little bit of that. Like, for instance, um, when when we uh, come back, I want to talk about uh, what it was like. I mean, what kind of an atmosphere you built these cars in, and and uh, because it, you brought up a really good point. Now today, these teams have these beautiful shops, and even a lot of the independent drivers have. You know, these teams have these incredible shops and facilities, and uh, you guys really had some basics, which you've got represented here in the museum upstairs. I, I remember seeing some things there. Um, and when we come back on Street Rod and Custom Radio, we'll talk more with Bill from uh, Speedway Motors right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. We're back. You're listening to Street Rod and Custom Radio. I'm your host, Brad Fanshawe. My co-host, Pete Shapour, is from SoCal Speed Shop is not here because we're on location in Lincoln, Nebraska at Speedway Motors, and I'm talking with Speedy Bill Smith himself right here today on the show. And don't forget, today's show is brought to you by Craftsman, America's most trusted tool brand. It's trust in your hands. When we went away, we were just kind of hitting on Bill. We were talking about we're bringing up through the years, and uh, you brought something up about uh, how racing back in the 40s and the 50s there was, uh, there was the danger element to it, of course, which uh, there's always a danger element, but it was pretty basic back then. Not a lot of safety equipment. And I know that one of the things that you've always been an advocate for is safety. And uh, was that brought on because of uh, your experiences in the early years and seeing some of the injury and, and death? Well, people had a different mindset then. And uh, lots of... My drivers, I had, as I mentioned before, I think 97 over that short 40-year career of racing hands-on. Uh, and as I would go to Knoxville, Iowa every Saturday night to run super modified sprint cars, things like that, uh, I'd probably be taking my best buddy who was going to drive the car that night, and I was going to keep it running and change the tires and do everything that you had to do, plus drive the tow rig and keep the trailer. You, you, you were the pit crew. You, I, was, <laughs> I was it. Uh, and it seemed like it was like taking somebody to the guillotine in that mum was the word. Yeah. There was no conversation, possibly relating to like when you went to grandma's funeral. Uh, you realized that death was around. What Was it almost kind of like, let's not talk about it because that could jinx us? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. And uh, I had one driver that, if I would have ever had a brother, uh, Lloyd Beckman was his name, fantastic uh, eye control, uh, quick. He could touch the tip of his toe and the tip of his nose in his prime and you couldn't see his hand move. People say that that's impossible. 
Well, you've seen fighters do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We don't all have those elements as we come out of the egg. He had his natural talents. Natural talents, and he honed those. And at one time, if he would have had more desire and less uh, fear and things like that, he could have gone to the top of Indianapolis or any higher level than we were running at the time. So, uh, and you recognize these things when you have a hands-on situation. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have uh, focus, you can see it in their eyes. Uh, and it's... Uh, so that had to be tough, I mean, because like you said, these were personal friends of yours. You, you, you built cars, and so you had the responsibility that you were the one building the cars, now you're taking them to the track. So it, it was a lot on your shoulders thinking, yeah. you know, if something goes wrong with the car, it's on me. If something goes wrong out on the track, I'm the one who brought them here. It's, and, uh, and, and so, but it kept, you kept motivated. You kept pushing. You kept going. Is it the, is that was the thrill of the competition and the challenge of the sport? Is that what it was? Lots of, lots of challenges, lots of thrills. Uh, and you can't put your finger on your passions. Yeah. Um, you, you can blend in with people who have the same passion at the, that point in time, but I don't think you can actually, and everybody's built different, you know. We all come out of the egg the same, but <laughs> there's a lot of difference in personalities and uh, desires, background, education. Uh, I happen to be a school teacher by education, and uh, so I learned that, you know, there was people who had 70 IQs and some had 160. Uh, well, you and I visited earlier before the interview, and, and we were both uh, very good friends with little John Butera. Sure. And uh, there's a really good example of the people that only saw what he achieved as a machinist and a mechanical engineer and, you know, really a genius in, in, in nice. our view because of the things that he innovated and but when you knew him as a friend and as uh, on that interpersonal level we we both know that that he had so much brain power but maybe he didn't put a lot of that to being a personable guy you know <laughs> it's, uh, well, yeah. and, but that's kind of what makes us laugh right there about him yeah. you know yeah. and uh, it's it's those it's those type of things and uh, Racing is full of personalities. It's always been full of personalities. Guys with gusto, guys with, um, you know, that driver that, as you said, that passion that you can't put a finger on it. And, uh, and I think that is what is, what has taken you to building this company and this museum and everything like that. And that's what I want to talk about when we come back. Um, this is Brad Fanshaw. You're listening to Street Rod and Custom Radio. And I'm here today at Speedway Motors with Speedy Bill Smith. And we've got more, so don't you dare go away. And we're back. You're listening to Street Rod and Custom Radio. I'm Brad Fanshaw, your host. And as I said, my partner on the mic from SoCal Speed Shop, that's Pete Shaporis. He's back in California today because I'm here at Speedway Motors in Lincoln, Nebraska, my old stomping grounds, and I'm getting an exclusive interview with Speedy Bill Smith. And we're talking about the early years. We're talking, we're going to bring you all the way up. We're going to give you the story today. And uh, we're kind of getting through the racing years talking about that. If you, if you didn't listen, remember, you can always tune in on uh, iTunes and catch that uh, webcast later on. But... Uh, you know, Bill, we were talking about it's the drive and the determination, but you took all of that from racing and you learned. And uh, would you say that's what you applied to your business? Because you were one of the very first speed shops in the Midwest when you opened. Well, I was one of the very first speed shops in the world. In the world, okay. Uh, to straighten it up. <laughs> no, hey, you know what? We're here to set the record straight. You know, if there's any anything floating around out there that you want to set the record straight, now's the time to do it. Well, there were a few uh, others, but, you know, in the middle of the U.S. where uh, most of the people think that the pigs and cows come from, <laughs> the perception is always everything. Uh, it was home always. Uh, I went to all the grade schools here, I went to all the high schools here, I went to all the 
colleges here, and uh, it was always home. So I didn't trade the feeling for home for the feeling for the California effort or the Texas effort or Florida or wherever it might be. It moves around, you know. You brought it to you. I brought it to me. And uh, that, that's easier said than done, <laughs> like all things in life. <laughs> but uh, it uh, became a challenge, naturally. And like I said before, I'm very competitive. So uh, my competitive uh, effort is in the business, in, in my racing career, uh, in street riding. Actually, in the early days, uh, when I started in 52, uh, we took our street cars that we raced on the street at night and drove to work in the daytime and et cetera, et cetera, took them to the county fair tracks and raced them on Sunday afternoon, the same vehicle. Your, uh, your street driver during the week, your racer, and then your weekend race car. Yeah, and uh, how do you explain those things <laughs> to people? <laughs> Well, I can say when I lived in Nebraska, there was a little of that, too. I used to have to explain to my parents why there was, uh, you know, nine-inch wrinkle walls on my Chevelle on Sunday morning, you know. Yeah. And, you know, that was just for looks. <laughs> but uh, that all transpired, and then, you know, I always equate it to going to see your doctor. In, in the old days, you went to your doctor. If your toe was sore or if your nose was sore... He fixed your toe and your nose. He didn't send you to his pal, a specialist. So as these hobbies, interests, whatever you called them at the time, as they grew, then you had the specialist that, oh, this guy does circle track cars. This guy builds custom cars. This guy uh, builds engines. Uh, he didn't know anything about the car that it's going in, but he'll build you the most horsepower that you ever <laughs> wanted in your whole life. And this is the way this all grew. Uh, probably like having a rose garden. And uh, you started out with one plant, and you loved roses. But as you saw other roses, well, here were pink ones. I thought they were all red. Uh, <laughs> I got gotcha. you. They're all different kinds. And some of these things are, like I said three or four times here, I hate to be repeating myself, but they are very hard to explain. Well, but the growth and the interest came with people who were doing things and then people who uh, respected the person that was doing them. Uh, not everybody respects who's the president today. Uh, you know, he's lucky if he gets 25% of the voting. Right. And so, uh, but uh, you have to re uh, remain humble. You can't be cocky uh, unless you're John Butera. <laughs> He was born that way. He came out of the egg that way. So, well, well let, me, let me reel this in a little bit. I, I think what you're trying to say is that, uh, let's put it in car guy terms, is that there's guys that uh, only like Mopars, or they only like Chevys, or they only like Fords. And you had a love. You kept looking out there and going, I like sprint cars. Hey, I like stock cars. Hey, I like street rods. I like motorcycles. And you, you gathered knowledge and acquired um, interest and is that how you built your company because you gathered all that knowledge and interest and a broad interest not a not a a, a real focused on one area you didn't just go for machined parts you went for trying to give something to all the different type of auto enthusiasts with your company uh that is true um early on there in we'll say building engines mm -hmm. for uh, the racer that uh, I was building. I, I built every piece of it. 
the cars you see here in the museum, they weren't bought over here and bought over here and bought over here, and I bolted them together. I built all those pieces. Okay. And uh, that's a hard thing to explain in today's society. But those uh, interests, uh, motorcycles in the 30s and the 20s from England had aluminum rocker arms on them. Well, who got the idea for aluminum rocker arms? Somebody who saw that and then transposed that item into putting them on a car. And there's so many things like that. Uh, I happen to be privy to go to the Ford Museum's clean out auction. Well, hold that thought because we got to go to another commercial break. We got to pay for this thing. So, hey, this is Brad Fanchon with Speedy Bill Smith here at Speedway Motors in Lincoln, Nebraska. Don't go away because you heard it. It's right on tip of his tongue. He's going to be talking about the Ford auction that he went to when we come back right here on Street Rod and Custom Radio. We're back. Thanks for sticking around. You're listening to Street Rod and Custom Radio. I'm your host, Brad Fanshaw, and I am here today. As I've told you before, we're in the heartland of America, Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm with Speedy Bill Smith, and he earned that name. We were talking about that earlier in the show because you know what? Names like that are earned. They're not just handed out as you, you know, roll into the uh, Nebraska line here. It's uh, something that he's done through years of racing and innovation, and we are here at the museum, and you're going to see some photos of this on our website and on my Facebook page at Bond Speed Brad Fanshawe, and uh, we're also going to have a bonus video for this episode. But when we were going away, we were talking about what built this company, what it takes to do that, and he was just about ready to tell us about a Ford auction that he attended. So, Bill, I'm going to go right back into it so you can tell us. I'm waiting to hear this one. Well, the Ford Museum in Detroit had decided they had too much junk that had come from the Ford Motor Company. Sounds like a sale I'd like to be at. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, opportunities seized and yes. opportunities missed. Uh, most of the boys at the bar talk about other things that yes. seized and missed. But uh, I was at that three-day sale and uh, drove home with my wife, Joyce, in a box, ton and a half box truck that we had driven in anticipation of buying a few things, uh, loaded so heavily that uh, I drove 35 miles an hour from Detroit, Michigan to Lincoln, Nebraska. That was a long trip back, wasn't it? Long trip. But if I would have had a little accident or tire blew out or something, all of those engines and things that I'd bought at the auction would have come forward and crushed me and my wife Joyce against the dash, and that wouldn't you, have wouldn't been have, good. you wouldn't have been able to. Yeah. We wouldn't have, have the job or anything. <laughs> so, it uh, there was always challenges every day, but at the Ford Museum, uh, you saw evidence of how they learned some of their things, and it they had English uh, cars there, they had French cars there, and. They, you call it reverse engineering sometimes. Yes. But it gives uh, the team or the crew or all the people that are working on projects, it gives them, it triggers their interest. It, it gives them a, a, something where they can, they not can everybody see. has one idea. Right. And right. so it's a melding of ideas, but they extrapolate it from pulling a car apart is what you're saying. Yeah, and you, and you can't, some people get it from uh, a, a, a drawing, an engineering drawing. Some people get it from a model. Mm -hmm. Some people get it from a dream. Uh, there's ideas come from many different ways. Well, speaking of dreams, and because we're, we're going to run out of show because you've done so much that we can't fit it into this short. So. 61 years, you can't fit in? Uh, no, not, not and do it justice, okay? We could do it really fast, but that wouldn't be any good. Let's talk about the company because um, when you started out, you, you, know, you started out in a speed shop on O Street. Then you grew and you started doing the mail order. And I mean, when I look over there today, I mean, how many square feet is that building over there, your warehouse? It's... The configuration is a half a million, 
but in a warehouse that holds the type product that we have in there, it is over twice that because of the way that uh, one of my sons have, happens to be a uh, engineer for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it uh, has, has got a lot of, uh, of ideas and uh, I think every day we sharpen the pencil and make it better. That's just the way the company has always worked. And, and that's what makes a good company. You can't say, okay, here it is. Now I'm going to go to my office and, you know, play yeah. on the web or something like that. It's you got to keep doing that. But one of the things that I notice, uh, uh, that I've always noticed about the Speedway Motors catalog is there are, you know, your competitors out there. But what I've noticed about yours is it seems to be really geared towards more the racer, the fabricator, the guy who's hands-on, because there's a lot of parts and pieces that aren't necessarily just you open the box and bolt it on, but it's, it's parts and pieces that can help me fabricate something else. Was that something that you really focused on? Uh, in the early days, focused on those things because they weren't available. Mm -hmm. uh, only through one or two shops all across the country. You know, if you lived in Pennsylvania, if you lived in Portland, Oregon, or uh, you weren't able to go and find that, period. You would spend a day or two or a week to find a clevis that was 5 yeah. eighths with a 3 eighths slot with a 3 eighths uh, bolt hole through it. And, you know, many of the parts at the time were war surplus from World War II that were developed then. So, uh, you know, I manufactured, you know, we, we built six thousand parts of our own right in this building. Six thousand parts. That's yeah. that's incredible. different yeah. different parts. And, and with this resurgence now of uh, you know what everyone calls more traditional street rods, you know rather than uh, the the super high tech, but going back to a little bit more traditional. Do you think that has uh, um, driven a lot of people to the Speedway Motors catalog? Well, it progressed. Uh, in my early days, if I could get my car ready to go to the gas station on Friday night and display it to my buddies, I only had to go six blocks. And it didn't need to handle and stop and do all the things that street rods have to do today. A street rod today has to drive and handle and, and work better than their brand new car that they bought at uh, 2014 for mama to drive. They re those cars have got to almost relate. Well, because as Not you said- Not in the look, but in the way they- And that's a really good point because you brought it up earlier in the show that the car you used to drive every day was your race car on the weekend. Now these guys drive something that's all cushy and soft during the week, and then they want to jump in that and have it cushy and soft yeah. on the weekend. Yeah. Hey, we're talking to Speedy Bill Smith right here at Speedway Motors. I'm Brad Fanshawe. Don't go away, because we've got more right here as we wrap it up on this week's edition of Street Rod and Custom Radio. Thanks for sticking around. This is Street Rod and Custom Radio. I'm your host, Brad Fanshawe. And we are wrapping up a great show and a fantastic interview with Speedy Bill Smith right here at Speedway Motors. Don't forget, you can find them on the on that interweb thing at uh, www.speedwaymotors.com. And we're filming today here at the museum. And this is the Museum of American Speed. And you can find them on the web at museumofamericanspeed.com. And one of the things that's so unique about this museum that you've you know, built here is that um, when people go to your uh, website, they're going to be able to find out that uh, this is open to the public. It's guided tours, and uh, it's a two-and-a-half-hour tour, and uh, there's a lot to see here. I mean, trust me, folks, when you, when you come here, it's well worth your two-and-a-half hours because when I walk in that door, the first thing that attracted me was, you know, I have a love of Miller board track cars because you, when you talk about innovation and things there, those Miller cars were it, and you've got that whole diorama up there, and... When, when you put this museum together, when you said, 
okay, I've got all these cars sitting around and all your pedal cars because you have your love of pedal cars. What, how do you just even start putting something like this down on paper that you're gonna that you're gonna build it? Because it has an atmosphere. It's not just lines of cars. Uh, that is always challenging. <clears throat> This museum, the Museum of American Speed, has the largest collection of racing and exotic engines in the world. And that's not what I say. That's what all of the media who have come from France and Australia and all around the world, that's what they say as they tell their readership. As uh, their eyes pop out right. when they see them, right? Yeah. And there's well over 600 exotic engines on display, uh, many of them one-offs, because the dream didn't become reality only first time. Some of them never finished. Uh, and this is through a period of over 100 years, not just the last 10 or 20 or et cetera, because, you know, the Model T Ford came into existence uh, in, the, in about 1907. And uh, a lot of the innovations in the automotive world were just after the turn of the century in, in other companies. Many of them couldn't stand the depression of the 30s. So Packard and some of the got very weak and had to go out of business later on. And all of these things that and, you know, uh, Studebaker was probably, in my mind, as successful at Indianapolis, but never won with their cars or their engines, but had an awful lot of second places. <laughs> and in life, nobody talked about who ran second. Right. Uh, if you're a racer, second is the first loser. <laughs> there you go. And that's... Uh, you know, uh, in absorbing all this as a young man and going through the aging process and so forth, uh, it uh, you you learn a lot from doing, touching, etc. And and building that company that's uh, sitting there across the street with that massive facility and all the products, that's also something that is ever growing, ever changing. Now you've got multiple catalogs. Uh, that, that reach out to the different racer groups, different enthusiast groups. And uh, I'll be the first to admit, I, I thought it was, you know, r hardcore racing and street rods and things like that. But nowadays, you even reach out to the guys who are the muscle cars because, let's face it, the 69 Camaro is kind of like the 32 Ford of today and for the guys that grew up kind of in my age group. Well, all ages change, all interests change. But if you have the world of wheels in your head as a young person, it will probably stay there for a long time. Well, I would say that uh, the automotive world, the passion for cars and, and racing and, uh, and collecting have, uh, have kept you young at heart and kept you moving along because uh, I see it seem every year and you've still got a grin on your face and when you're rolling around talking to the people and seeing what's new there. And uh, uh, would you say that is something that's kept you very motivated? Well, individuals keep you motivated. Uh, because every, you can learn from everybody, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been privileged to know everybody in the performance business. They told okay. me they knew you. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know them. Uh, you know, the Mickey Thompsons, the, the Shelbys, uh, you know, Linda Vons, the, everybody in the performance business because in the 50s and 60s, it was a very small nucleus of people all across the United States. It wasn't a big group like the SEMA show is today. Right. It, it, it was a select group of people. And, and I'm sorry to say, we're out of time. And I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, there's, you, your again. stories keep going. I want to I hear more. We will. I'll take you up on that. Thanks, everybody. We've been here at Speedway Motors in Lincoln, Nebraska. Bill, thanks so much for taking the time today and being on Street Riding Custom Radio. 
Well, it's fun to do or I wouldn't have done it. Thank you so much. Don't go away because next week we'll have even more. <laughs>